You've probably heard of the quantum wave functions before, written as a cat factor like this. You might then also be familiar with the bra cat notation. Maybe you know that these factors live in abstract Hilbert spaces, and that they can be used to compute superposition measurements, spin interactions and even scattering reactions in quantum field theory. But what the hell does all of this mathematical gibberish actually represent? How did physicists come up with these incredibly abstract ideas to begin with? To see this, let's take a look at one of quantum mechanics most famous experiments, the double slit experiment. The idea of this experiment is to fire many electrons at a wall with two slits, after which the electrons are caught on a detector behind the wall. Classically, you would expect the detector to show two shadow lines corresponding to each slit in the wall. However, what we observe is that the electrons travel as waves through both slits, creating an interference pattern at the detector. This gave physicists the idea of describing electrons, or particles in general, not as classical spheres, but as waves traveling through space instead. Think about this for a moment. A particle is now not anymore located at a position in space, but must also be described at every point in space with some probability. This makes scattering reactions, for example, instantly much harder to compute, let alone more complex interactions between particles. To this end, let us introduce the Hilbert space. A Hilbert space is defined to be the set of functions across space that could in principle describe the state of a particle. These functions must describe waves stretching across all of space. But instead of looking at the entire universe already, let us start with a set of three spatial coordinates x1, x2 and x3. A particle in this case has the option to sit at positions x1, x2 and x3, and we know that in quantum mechanics, the particle can be at the superposition of the three spatial coordinates. The particle has to be somewhere, so we only want the sum of the probabilities of finding the particle at any of the three positions to be exactly one. The total wave function is just the height of each dot in this graph. By taking an infinite amount of points, we indeed obtain the continuous function over all of space again. We can also plot these three spatial points in a three-dimensional vector space, where each spatial coordinate corresponds to one of the basis vectors of the vector space. We can then fill the space with vectors that correspond to wave functions, and the only requirement we have is that the vectors must correspond to a probability of finding the particle of one. Just like the previous example, we can say that the taking the sum of the vector components along each basis vector must equal 1. But it is more intuitive to say that the length of the vector must equal 1. From the Pythagorean theorem, we know that the sum of the squares of all vector components must then be equal to 1. So the normalization constraint only applies to squared wave functions, which is a result of the Born rule, a key postulate at the heart of quantum mechanics. With this mathematical setup out of the way, let us take a look at some examples. If we know the particle is at position x1, the vector will be pointing along the x1 direction. If the particle is in some kind of superposition between the three spatial coordinates, the vector will point along all three spatial directions in some way. The vector we just looked at is written as a cat vector psi here, which is just a fancy notation for a vector in Hilbert space. Now how would we write down the normalization condition in this vector notation? We just decided that the length of the vector must equal 1, so if we take the dot product of psi with itself, it should equal 1. You might be familiar with the dot product from linear algebra, where if we have two vectors a and b, dot product a times b is given by multiplying all vector components of a with the corresponding vector components of b like this. The same is true for vectors in Hilbert space. Here we just write a dot product not with a dot, but with a combination of a bra and a cat vector. You can also call this the inner product of these vectors. The normalization condition of psi may then be written like this. The use of dot products becomes even more apparent when working in a specific basis. In our case, the three spatial coordinate basis. Say we want to know how much our wave function is pointed along the x1 direction, we simply take the bra cat combination of the wave function and the x1 basis vector. This inner product can be seen as the length of the component of psi along the direction of the x1 vector. The same can be seen in our three-dimensional example. The component of our wave function psi along the x1 direction is just the inner product between the x1 basis vector and the wave function vector. 
Remember that this is an example in three spatial coordinates only, and we have to extend the space to contain an infinite number of orthogonal basis vectors, which is just a little tricky to visualize. And that's all there is to it. Using Hilbert spaces, quantum mechanical interactions can just be computed using the linear algebra of infinite dimensional vector spaces. One more point that I have to make is that in reality, the wave functions are necessarily complex objects, which means that the inner product in Hilbert space changes into a complex inner product, where the bra vectors become the complex conjugate of the usual cat vectors. In our intuitive picture, this does not change much, only the basis vectors split up into a real and imaginary part, which is just very difficult to visualize using only three dimensions. The rest of the quantum magic resides in finding the right equations of motion for the wave functions and being able to handle coordinate transformations. The latter is very easily done using our linear algebra techniques and I might make a follow-up video on this subject. For now thank you very much for watching and I hope you learned something from this video.